Hi everyone, it's Kathy with Journey into Cybersecurity, and today I'm I'm super excited uh, because it's our tenth episode. So it's ten podcasts with the partnership of TNT Creative Group, and we've we've done some magic so far. And um, as a capstone of this first season. I've invited um, a fantastic guest, so you're going to be thrilled to hear his story. And without further ado, introducing you, Devon Carter. Hi, Devon. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to this podcast, and thank you for joining us. Um, how about you introduce yourself? Um, okay, uh, my name is Devon Carter. Um, I work in cybersecurity amongst uh, a couple of other things. Let's let's dig a little bit deeper there. Right. So you say you work in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What's your title? And, and translate that into certain activities <laughs> that uh, a 10 year old can wrap their heads around. Okay. So my official title um, is cybersecurity senior manager, um, senior vice president uh, for a very large financial institution. Um, in layman's terms, I, I manage a team of phenomenal cybersecurity architects, and our job, um, their job, is primarily to um, create blueprints of any and every type of application in the business portfolio, and to uh, identify risks, uh, identify controls that can be used for mitigation, and to uh, just look at everything from a security perspective. So, yes, I like how you kind of use the term blueprint mm -hmm. in light of the term, the title of an architect mm -hmm. kind of makes it easier to understand what that could look like um, comparing, you know, how you build a house versus how you build infrastructure, IT infrastructure. It's very well, interesting. Well, you know, if you think about it, so, you know, starting off as an engineer you're very very narrowly focused into maybe a specific technology right so the goal is to get very very deep and learn a whole lot about this one or two things mm -hmm. but as you move up the chain and become an architect you have to start getting wider and not as deep right and so that's mm -hmm. what my team does and so when we talk about blueprints you know it might be we call it might call a low level design or a high level design or a blueprint mm -hmm. things like that and so it kind of all works together pretty well, just like a traditional architect might. Yeah. Awesome. So um, let's start with the beginning. Okay. Let's let's talk about Devon the kid. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so where did you grow up, and what kind of a kid were you? Um. Wow. So I grew up in Chesapeake, Virginia, Portsmouth, Virginia, um, pretty much all, all my life. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Virginia Beach, all, all in the Hampton Roads area up in uh, Virginia. Um, a lot of military, because um, there's a lot of Navy bases there. Um, my father was actually retired um, Navy. And so um, that was the area I grew up in. It's a great area, beautiful area. I, you know, my parents, uh, we had a, a beautiful little house, brick house on a lake. It was, um, it was really, really cool. As far as me, the child, um, I'll be honest with you. I was the oldest little kid you ever wanted to meet. People would tend to say I have an old soul, so to speak. <laughs> and I think that's because uh, there's a 13 year gap between me and my siblings. Mm -hmm. and so um, my parents were a bit older once I came into the picture. And so I, I just think it was kind of naturally they made me kind of older, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. They probably treated you like the older kid, too, not like the little kid. You know what? That's that's actually that's very, very accurate. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the things I was doing at a young age, uh, were pretty, pretty interesting. Everything from, I remember, you know, my parents teaching me how to, you know, iron clothes at like six and eight years old and cook dinners and mm -hmm. you know, literally learn how to, you know, wax floors. And my dad used to have me, um, I grew up on a lake. And so my dad wanted to extend the backyard. And so what he did was he would have his friends 
come and drop like huge pieces of concrete in the backyard so you can kind of build up the foundation and everything like that. Well, probably around eight or nine years old, I started going out there with a sledgehammer and breaking the rocks. And so, um, you know, probably doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing as a kid, but you know, that's just the way it was. They, yeah. So. Well, it, it kind of makes me wonder how it encourages a young child to really believe in themselves and to, to try, you know, going beyond what is expected from a little kid um, or the average little kid at that age. So it's kind of a cool thing. It, I agree. Um, I had a, you know, when it came to like working hard and knowing how to do things, um, I, I was very confident as a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, my mother, um, she used to like do like, you know, home-based businesses for back then, like selling stuff, you know, home interiors or Mary Kay and stuff like that. And she was really, really good at it. And so, you know, by the time I was, when I was eight, she taught me how to do the books for her business. So I was actually going through, you know, doing accounting, doing receipts, helping her deliver packages to people and stuff like that. Because wow. It was important to her, you know, that I could take care of myself. And that's kind of a, um, and I don't know if I'm skipping ahead, but my, my mother, a really, really tremendous woman, um, she passed away in 2014. Mm -hmm. And, um, profound loss for my entire family. But my mother's mother, my grandmother, she passed away when my mom was five years old. Oh, so wow. I didn't have a long time with her mother. Before I was born, my mother had already been diagnosed with cancer and they had put oh. numerous timetables on her life. And so I think the reason why they kind of forced me to grow up so quick is because my mother felt like she didn't know how long she was gonna be here. Yeah. And so she was showing me as much as she could for, you know, as quickly as she could. But thank yeah. God she she lived into her 70s. She, she, you know, she, yeah. she outlived her doctors and two husbands. So <laughs> so wow. uh, she's she was a tough lady. So I miss her a lot. Oh, and I'm deeply sorry, but what a strong spirit she was and how this influenced your mindset. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about mindset throughout this talk because I feel you have so much to teach other kids on that. Um, so what what did you do in school, uh, middle school, high school, and so forth? What, what did you like doing? Um, I'll be honest with you, my favorite subject, even when I struggled in it, has always been math. I've always been math. I don't know why I wasn't the greatest math student by any stretch of the imagination, but it was just something about the exactness of it. I like mm -hmm. numbers for some reason. And so, right. um, you know, I remember uh, in middle school, um, after sixth grade, the teachers recommend you for the next level of math they want you to take, they think you can handle. And I remember vividly going to my parents and saying, no, I want to take the higher math. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take the one she recommended. And so um, my parents signed a permission slip and went in and I struggled, but it, it came around. I ended up getting it. So um, that's just kind of how I always have been. Like when people challenge me or say I can't do something, that just kind of flips a switch. And I think a lot of people are like that, right? So. Yeah. Well, I don't know if a lot of people are like that, but I love that, that you are <laughs> and that you're sharing this story right now because I think some people may kind of learn from that. So growing up, um, what did you outside extracurricular anything else um, oh, that you yeah. like doing? Oh, so um, I mean, I started playing organized sports from the time I was eight years old all the way through college. To be honest with you, so mm -hmm. I, I've always been an athlete. Um, I've always I was always a kind of a ch chubby, chunky guy, and so I got picked on sometimes. Mm -hmm. However, when people noticed how actually athletic and good I was at sports. They kind of backed off. They left me alone, and so sports was definitely a, a safe haven for me. Mm -hmm. um, I played them a lot: baseball, I played basketball, I played football. In high school, I started running track. In middle school, I wrestled. I mean, you know, even wow. after college, I boxed for a while. 
I mean, I, I love, you know, athletic competition. So. Right. Yeah. And what did you want to be growing up? How, how did you see yourself as an adult? Well, early on, it was um, kind of weird. Um, I used to tell my mother and father I wanted to be a lawyer and a comedian. <laughs> At the same time. Yeah, I wanted to be a lawyer <laughs> and a comedian. I have no idea where the comedian came from. Um, but the, the lawyer thing, my, my mother used to love like Matlock and Perry Mason mm -hmm. and all those legal shows. And so obviously I was watching them with her and I just became enamored with, oh man, you know, that looks cool. They command the room. They can do stuff. They can you know, argue and this is that. And it just looks so cool to me. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of what I took from it. And so what that taught me was the importance of images for kids growing up, letting them be exposed yeah. to different things because that's how they figure out, you know, themselves a little bit, figure out what they want, what they like. And so um, that was yeah. that was something I wanted to do now. Um, yeah. I like that you just said that, you know, you can only be what you can see, right? So mm -hmm. you, the the power of good role models mm -hmm. is is underestimated, I think. And that's why we're doing this. That's why you are here today with me. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> no, absolutely. I want I want young people to see your story and see themselves in you and know that anything is possible. So what was um, something in middle school or high school that kind of left a, a lasting impression on you? Not necessarily something that you read in a book per se, but still that kind of touched you and, and, and moved you in a certain direction. Um, so in middle school, I would say I kind of learned about fear and unfair. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned that, you know, I asked my mom and dad to allow, you know, sign a permission form for me to take a more advanced math class. Well, the problem is, is that the teacher who recommended me for the lower math class was also the same teacher who taught the advanced math class. Mm -hmm. And she was none too happy that, you know, I, I did that. She was not pleased that, you know, I decided mm -hmm. to override her recommendation and try to do something harder. Wow. Um, and so uh, she made it a little difficult for me, which is why I struggled initially. Um, so I, I kind of taught, I kind of learned about fair and unfair. Mm -hmm. um, in in high school, I'll be honest with you, um, I don't know a major lesson I learned in high school. To be honest with you, other than I, I'll say this, I learned the importance of not doing dumb stuff. <laughs> so so um, it wasn't anything specific, but um, I remember I was I was pretty good, a pretty good football player. And my coach brought me into his office and he basically said, hey, here are these letters from these schools that are interested in you. And I said, great, I got excited. He said, OK, well, now let's look at your grades. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that is <laughs> not good. So <laughs> because, uh, you know, my, my grades were not great by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I, I mean, it, they just weren't good. And so my coach basically broke it down to me and said, hey, if you want to be eligible through the NCAA in college, your senior year, you have to make the honor roll your entire senior year and you have to get over a certain score for your SATs. And keep in mind, I'd never made the honor roll in high school, not a single time. Mm -hmm. I literally figured out what scores I needed to get in order to remain eligible for sports. And I would, I would almost get that exact score every time. I just figured out how many I need to get right. And then the rest of it was like, all right, I'll get it. We'll keep it moving. So what that taught me was, is that first of all, he challenged me. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I learned that when I get challenged, I, I tend to respond pretty well. So I ended up making the honor roll my entire senior year. Um, I was eligible for sports. I hit my SAT score. And so it just it just taught me that I'm better than I thought I was. Yeah. That I could do it if, if I really needed to. Yes. So I think 
learning what's possible in yourself, what you can do, I think is a very important lesson. So, Yes. And how amazing that that coach took the time mm -hmm. to give you that opportunity to believe in you, put, to put you up for success early, proactively. Yep. Absolutely. Because, you know, he could have told me that my senior year and then it just would have been like, okay, well, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I, you know, very grateful for that. So, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I'll say the other important part of that, that it didn't just make me eligible for sports. Um, what it did was it helped me to get into college. Yes. All right. Because my grades weren't great. Mm -hmm. That senior year, seeing the type of courses that I was taking, I was taking mm -hmm. trigonometry, I was taking advanced this, advanced that to try to get my GPA and things back. You know, um, some schools actually said, okay, well, maybe he's not, maybe he's not a loser. He can do it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so um, it, it, had a, it had a really, really profound impact on me moving forward. So. Yeah, so amazing. So what was next? What came after high school then? Uh, I went to college. Um, yeah, uh, I went to I went on a visit to East Carolina University um, during my senior year. I didn't. I never even heard of the school. It was only two hours away from my home. <laughs> I never heard of it. And so I went on a visit, and I had you know none of you know my none of my siblings finished college. And so this was my first chance to really be on a college campus. And I saw it and I felt it, it was love at first sight. <laughs> I, I, I went, you know, and I, I just was like, look, I don't, I'll be here in the fall. I don't need to go anywhere else. Yeah. So I, I loved it. It was great. Um, and so, yeah, that, I went to college and uh, started my, my journey. Yeah. And again, to the power of images and mindset is being mm -hmm. able to see yourself somewhere mm -hmm. and just going there yeah. <laughs> once you had that image. Just going there. Um, it was it, it was great. It was a really, really awesome thing. I, you know, so, um, you know, once I once I got in college, um, something I'd always been good at. My, my dad was like um, he was a maintenance mechanic for the post office after he retired from the military. And so they would do like electrical work and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. he, would, he would teach me that stuff. He would buy me these little boxes and they would have wires and all these different connections and it would have different schematics. And so if you wired them a certain way, the box would do something different. So you could make it make it become a radio, a stoplight or oh, wow. whatever. So electronics was like, OK, well, I'll just do that. Yeah. And so um, that's what I did. I, I got I started off in the electronics program at East Carolina University in the School of Industrial Technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after my freshman year, well, I'll tell you this story. So I don't know what happened in college, but things just clicked for me academically. So my first semester, I ended up getting like five A's and a C. Uh, I had a 3.6 GPA. I only got the C because I overslept from putting an all-nighter for a psychology exam. And so um, I told my parents what my school, my GPA was, and they literally like, yeah, that's, you. okay, we need to see proof. <laughs> so I had to literally like uh, send them my, my grade so they would believe that I'd actually accomplished that. Yeah. And so, you know, it just kind of, kept going from there. I, I did pretty well, but uh, back to my, my other story. So after my freshman year, the department realized, I think, and this is just my guess, that they really couldn't, they weren't like a full engineering school, right? So they weren't like electrical engineering. And so competing with NC State and some of the other schools mm -hmm. that had like real engineering programs, they were like, okay, probably not the best idea right now. So they switched over to something called computer networking, network engineering. Right. And so my sophomore year, they brought all the electronics majors into a room and said, here's what we're doing. OK, if you're this far along, you can keep on electronics. But if you're just starting, yeah, that's programs going away. And so you can switch over to computer networking mm -hmm. or you can completely change your major. And so they said, we're going to be teaching you this stuff called Cisco. 
And I was like, like the food? Oh, <laughs> like, this girl? Like, what? what is that? I had no idea. And so I was like, all right, well, I don't want to change majors. That might make me take longer to graduate. <laughs> so let's let's play this out. And probably, mm-hmm. you know, initially one of the best decisions I ever made. Mm-hmm. I did I did pretty well. I excelled in it. It was an awesome, awesome program. Um, my professors were great. Um, I mean, it was, I just, I can't say enough about, you know, what East Carolina University did for me, like, as far as maturing me, helping me to see different things, meet different types of people, mm-hmm. really just kind of develop, um, develop me as a human being. Right. So, um, it was, it's a really great experience. Um, I joined the track team while I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I went there to, I was going to go play football. And I was literally out on the football field (laughs) doing a practice and I was looking around the field and I was like, I don't really want to do this anymore. (laughs) Good that you said at the beginning. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, I just, I, I, I normally, you know, when I played football before I could get up for the moment and things like that. And it's just like, man, I really don't feel like being here. Yeah. And so um, I didn't go back. I didn't go back. And so um, my friend from high school, who was also at East Carolina, and he was on a full track scholarship. Um, he said, "Hey, I remember you used to be a thrower and, and a sprinter at in, um, in high school. Why don't you come out for the track team?" And I was like, "All right. Well, at least keep me in shape. It's something to do." Yeah. So I went and did it, and it ended up in the end working out very, very well for me. Yeah. Very, very well. So um, set some school records. Um, I was named athlete of the year my senior year. Wow. Um, That's awesome. Ended up working out pretty well. So So I I used to be a baseball mom, a soccer mom. My kids, my kids kind of grew out of that. um, (laughs) And that's okay. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in North Carolina, at least as much as I can tell, there's a lot of pressure on children to perform almost competitively on a constant basis, travel, ball, whatever you want, want to call it, um, from a very young age, middle school, yeah. high school, and then into college. And um, how does that work once you're in college? You got accepted thanks to a sports scholarship or something, but then you also have to yeah. perform at two yeah. levels. How does that work? So I didn't get a scholarship into East Carolina. I got invited to go there. Yeah. A little different. And so um, when I went there, um, I mean, it really wasn't, honestly, it's hard for me to say because I didn't have anybody like pushing me to Mm -hmm. do it like hard like that. I just wanted to do it. Yeah. It was fun to me, like competing against other people to see how good you are that really was like, yeah, I can do that. Um, you know, if we go back to my childhood a little bit, like I said, I was I was a bigger kid. And when I first started playing football, I was literally too big for my age group. <laughs> and so my mother had to sign a permission slip for me to pe- play for a higher age group. Yeah. Um, with a higher, with older amount of kids. Well, I had been playing with older kids already, you know, for mm-hmm. a large chunk of my life. All my friends were a couple of years older than me. Yeah. So even then I would go there and I, I dominated the older kids. Like I was really, really good. And yeah. So that fed my confidence. And so I just wanted to do it all the time. So yeah. push me. Yeah. So. But the 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 point of the question is how did you balance sports and academics? It, it in, was so in college. So it's a great question. So um I had great professors mm-hmm. that's what it boiled down to when you when you run track in in uh, college sometimes your track meets are like you know Wednesday, you know thursdays and fridays you're leaving on wednesday or leaving on thursday morning and things like that so you're missing two days of class but well, that's mm-hmm. significant if you're doing that like every week yes and so um i had a professor i never forget him mr lee totterick he just retired from east carolina uh, Mr. Lee Totter, he used to, um, me and three of my other track teammates were all in the same major. 
And he would, on Saturday mornings when we weren't traveling, he would open up the lab for us, bring us coffee and donuts, and he would just hang out and give us the extra attention and extra help that we needed, you know, all day Saturday or wow. Sunday. I mean, he didn't have to do that. But, it, I mean, I, I believe that's a real reason that really propelled me to, to excel in the program. Mm -hmm. right? Somebody actually showed some interest. They show enough care. And they were willing to make a sacrifice for me. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make sure I don't screw this up because yeah. I wanted to show him I was appreciative. Yes. So, um, it, that that kind of helped. The balancing everything else. I mean, I was a resident advisor in college as well. <laughs> and so, um, uh, I mean, it just, I'm naturally probably, what was it, ADHD? I can't just do one thing. <laughs> like if you give me one thing to do, I'm probably not going to do well at it. But if you give me five, I'll do well at all five of them. Wow. So I'm kind of weird like that. <laughs> That's kind of cool, though. I wish I was good at five things all at the same time. That doesn't work for me. Oh, well, I, just, I mean, I I just don't know another way to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as, um, as a young man, you know, and not to go too far off the rails, but as a young man, as a young black man, being always, I've always been a big guy. I was, I was bigger than my dad by the time I was in the seventh grade. So, so I've always been big. And so my mother would teach me to, you know, make sure you're not intimidating people. Mm -hmm. So I would kind of have to play, play it down a little bit, or she would teach me, you're going to have to work harder than everybody else to get what other people are getting. Yeah. So those are things that were instilled in me. And so my my natural inclination is, okay, I have to outwork everybody else to a, a, a huge margin in mm -hmm. order to get, you know, opportunities that some others, you know, may have. Yeah. And so yeah. you know, good or bad is, is serving pretty well. No, let's talk about the role models in your life. It sounds like your parents played a huge part. Oh yeah, oh yeah. My um, my father, he was a really, really great dude. Um, he he had some struggles, but when I think about it, all in all, I mean, I had everything I needed and most of what I wanted. You know, I never had to worry about you know uh, any type of instability financially or anything mm -hmm. like that throughout my entire childhood. Yeah. Um, and he, he taught me the importance of making sure you're taking care of your business, making sure you're putting things in order, right? And so that's the lessons that I took from him. And then, you know, later in life, he taught me the importance of, of giving. My, um, my father passed away in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the funeral, you know, all of these people showed up. I mean, it was hundreds of people. And we were like, okay, um, because my dad, he was a great dude, but he was, we'll just say rough around the edges. And so, you know, we were like, okay, it's a terrible joke. We were like, are they here just to make sure he's dead? Or <laughs> what? <laughs> I know it's a terrible joke. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what it was is, my father had been giving and helping so many people without ever telling anybody. Yeah. So all came to show respect. Wow. Um, the stories that I heard, um, I cherish to this day that one man said, you know, your father bought a brand new car and I told him I was going on my first date and my, your father gave me his car so I could make a good first impression. He's like, brand new, he just bought it. And I was like, wow. He said, I married that woman. I'm still married to her today. Oh, you know that's I mean? awesome. Like, people like, you know, he, he used to buy me groceries every other week because we were, things were strapped. And, you know, just story after story like that, it it just blessed me so much and let me know the importance of giving. Yeah. You know, and so um, he was definitely a role model for me. And then my mother, she was just, man, she was a tough old lady. I mean, she didn't, you know. You know, over her, she she battled cancer for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people, you know, hear that and like, oh, well, she had cancer 40 years ago and went to remission. And I had to tell them, no, 
over 40 years, my mother had breast cancer, lung cancer, optical mm -hmm. nerve cancer, liver cancer, spine cancer, hip cancer, thigh cancer, mm -hmm. over 40 years. And she, you wouldn't know it until like maybe the last year where she kind of got really sick. Mm -hmm. that, she lived a good life. She traveled. She had a great time. She always smiled. You never knew anything was wrong with her. She was just tough. Yeah. So, um, just a tremendous role model for me. Mm -hmm. And then my my siblings, I mean, they always <laughs> they always really really try to keep me on the right track. You know, you know. So I, I they're just great. I had some really really great role models. Yeah. That's awesome. Were there any cheerleaders? Um, we talked about your coach and some other teachers too. Any other cheerleader supporters throughout your life? Yeah, my, my, it's funny. My my mom's friends. Um, yeah, my dad's friends. Uh, they used to. I mean, honestly, it really was like a real family type thing. They, yeah, you know, they they came to my football games, came to see me play sports and everything. They were always asking about me. You know, I could be walking somewhere and somebody that I didn't know recognized me because of, you know, my dad or my mom. And so it was just, you know, it was a it was a bit of a community. And so yeah. I had a lot of I had a lot of support, you know. That's so, awesome. Yeah, and they say it takes a village. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like I said, again, the other things, my parents were older, and so you know, a lot of their friends, they always just kind of looked in on me, looked out and things like that. And so it was really cool. I had great friends in my neighborhood, um, their families. I mean, we're always doing sleepovers. Uh, one of my friends, they would, uh, their dad uh, would drive us to New York during the summers and, you know, see things in King's Dominion and Bush Gardens. And so, I mean, I had, had a lot of people supporting me, so. That's fantastic. Let's um, move on to the topic of mentorship. I know that you actively mentor people now and that you've you've been mentored along the way too. What's your take on mentorship? Uh, it's extraordinarily important. Um, you know, it's funny. <laughs> Even uh, even today, you know, in the position I'm in, I, I'm looking for a mentor now for myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I have I have a couple of people who are in that role, but I'm looking for some more mentorship because I want to continue to learn and grow. Um, I believe mentorship was, you know, extraordinarily important to me throughout, you know, throughout college and especially early in my professional career. Um, they 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 can help. Even if they don't tell you what to do, they can help you learn what not to do, mm -hmm. which is just as important. And so um, I think mentorships, mentors are just, they're really important because they have knowledge through experience that you just don't have yet. And if you will listen, you know what I mean? If you will pay attention, if you will listen, um, it can help you avoid a lot of pitfalls. Yeah. One thing, um, and I know I talk about my mom a lot, so I'm sorry. One thing she told me, and this may sound mean, so but it wasn't mean. So listen mm -hmm. to the old <laughs> So one thing she told me, I forget, I was young. I, I might have been in middle school, might have been younger. I can't remember. Uh, but she told me, she said, uh, she said, Devon, she said, you are probably the, the, the least talented of my children. Yeah. Yeah, that's something to say, right? But she said, but you will be far more successful than your siblings because you will listen. Uh -huh. That's what she told me. Yeah. And so it didn't break me because it's my mom. I know she's telling me for a reason and I trusted her. Mm -hmm. But it let me know the importance of listening. Yeah. So my closest friends, you know, are usually like 10 years older than me. Like they that's. I, I always want to be around people with experience. I always like being around older people mm -hmm. because I can learn so much from them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so yeah. So mentorship is very key. Yeah. Wow. So she planted that seed of a growth mindset right then and there. Yeah. That's amazing. Let's, 
Let's talk about your very first job. Oh man. So my very first job, and I hope my employer today doesn't see this, is still probably my favorite job. <laughs> um so when I graduated from college, I didn't like have a job lined up. Mm -hmm. um, and so um I worked as a security guard for like two months before I got my first real industry job in, in IT. And my first real industry job in IT, I was a junior network technician um, for a department of, for a contracting firm for the Department of Defense. And so um, I remember I went in for the interview and the gentleman who was interviewing me, um, I had applied to this job 13 times. <laughs> okay? Importance of, of persistence, everybody. I applied to the job 13 times. He brought me into the interview and he was like, look, I'm bringing you in to ask you to please stop applying. <laughs> A lot of you not. That's He was like, dude, you're, you're, you're doing too much. And so um, it was really, really funny. And, you know, and he was dead serious. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, well, can we just still have the interview? It's good, you know, good practice anyway. And so we had an interview. And we started talking and yeah. then we started talking about sports right and as soon as we started talking about sports oh i could we, you know i could kick it into high gear i could talk sports <laughs> and so we we talked for probably about an hour and then you know we got to the subject of the job i was like dude you know so what's what is it about this job that i'm not qualified for is a skill that i need to get and he was like honestly the main reason that we didn't really want you is because you had a college degree. It's like, oh, mind blown. <laughs> like, totally. Hey, you mean everything that everybody's ever told me <laughs> about getting the job, I'm, I wasn't supposed to do that? Are you, are you kidding? And then he, then he further explained, he was like, everybody in there were, you know, ex-military. Ex mm -hmm. None of them had college degrees. And their impression of people with college degrees had been they always looked down on them. Yeah. And so they were like, look, we got a good group. We don't want to introduce anybody in here that's going to cause issues like that. And I said, oh, I said, man, is that your problem? I said, dude, I know I'm not smart right now. I don't know anything. I'm just going to sit in the back and I'm going to take notes and I'm going to learn as much as I can, as quick as I can, so I can make you guys some money. And then he looked and he said, you know what? All right, I'll give you a shot. He said, that's all I need. And that that the rest was history. And so um that's how that's how my first job. Now that first job, it's not a, it wasn't a normal first job for anybody like me. Um I had my degree, I, I got my my CCNA and my CCNP, you know, by the time I graduated or soon after I graduated, within like a month or so, which are Cisco certified networking associate. Cisco Certified Networking Professional Certification. So I, I, I had some knowledge, I had some skills, um, but I hadn't worked in the real world. So I, I really yeah. didn't do anything. And so um, that first job, I was literally going on ships in the Atlantic Fleet of the Navy and setting up their routers and setting up their switches, setting up, setting up off ship communications, I mean, I was on some really, really high level technical stuff to be a junior network technician. Yeah, that's so pretty cool. <laughs> it really was, you know, um, they fly you around, do different things, see different things. I mean, it was really, really fun job doing cutovers on the weekends, you know, before I was married and had a family, that was really cool. Because you literally probably slept on a boat for two or three days. Uh, so it was, it was just an awesome, and awesome experience. I, I, I still think have fond memories of it to this day. Yeah. And I, I again want to stress the importance of this mindset that you had, this can do attitude and, and persistence, just oh. sticking with it and believing in yourself. Oh and, yeah. And, and just approaching the person in, in a way by listening mm -hmm. and 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 really trying to meet a need that they needed to fill and not making it about you but making it about them uh, 
that's all you do. Yeah. You know, to, to any young people that are listening, find what people need and give it to them. Mm-hmm. You'll probably do okay. You know, so, um, but yeah. And so uh, I learned a lot on that first job. I, I certainly learned how to make mistakes. Um, I made a huge mistake on like my first assignment and I'll never forget it. I go on the boat and they're all in, um, I think it's called ADP. It's the room where they have all the computers and servers. Mm-hmm. So I go down in there and they're struggling. They can't get the routers to connect to the shore and they're just having all kinds of issues. And I was like, okay, well, you mind if I take a look? And so I look, I go in there, I turn on a couple of debugging and things like that in the Cisco router because I'm I'm fancy guy. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I can handle it. And so I actually figure out the problem. I figure out the problem. I, I remember it vividly. They had the, it was a OSPF, which is a routing protocol. They had um, encryption keys on it and they had mistyped the encryption key so it couldn't mm-hmm. link up the, uh, the sites. And so I found it in debugging and I fixed it and everything came up and it was great. It was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so instead of me, uh just say okay job well done and leave i decide no let me keep looking through this router and see if i can find any more issues for me to fix since i'm so good <laughs> well there was a command in there i never forget it it's the command was default information originate um and i know this is very might be kind of technical right now but i remember it because that that command tells this router to advertise itself as the gateway for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it had a huge number at the end of it, which was like a metric to make it the least preferred because we didn't want the router on this boat to become the gateway for everybody else. Right. Well, I had never seen that metric number before. So I said, oh, that must be messing up something. Let me get rid of that metric. <gasps> so I took the command out, put that, put it in without the metric, and then I started hearing a lot of people walking really fast. <laughs> then I started hearing people running. <laughs> then I started hearing people yelling. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what's going on? So then somebody came in, hey, did you do something on the router? I was like, yeah, I, I fixed this command. No, why did you do that? You just made us the default gateway for the Atlantic fleet. They're going to shut us down. And I'm sitting here like, <laughs> oh man, I just fired myself. So, <laughs> so I quickly fixed it, put it back. The shore, sure enough, shut us down, turn off our communications till we fixed it. Um, and so they promptly kicked me off the boat. <laughs> so I have to go back to uh my office and I'm like starting to pack up my desk because I know I'm getting fired out of this one. Uh, and I go into my boss's office and he's he's got like this smirk grin kind of thing going on. He's like, so I, I hear you had a pretty exciting day. <laughs> I was like, yeah, something like that. He was like, he said, OK, well, congratulations. You're now an engineer. I was like, what? He said, dude, he said, I don't want to work with any engineer who's never made a mistake because that means they're not learning. They're not trying to grow. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, yeah, just don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> all right. And so he he was great because that was a moment where he could have crushed me. Mm-hmm. Instead, he built built me up. Yeah. And, um, it was it was a tremendous experience. I never made a mistake again. I will make sure I say that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and I, I did pretty well for them. They were, they were really happy with me. Wow, what a powerful lesson. (laughs) Making mistakes is okay as long as you learn from them. Absolutely. Oh, mind blown. (laughs) All right, so you you got into that field. I I know you're now into finance, so there's a story there, but... I also know that you started studying 
law. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, I told you before that as a kid, I said, I want to be a lawyer and a comedian. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, my high school grade said otherwise. So, uh, well, the comedian part I probably could have done. <laughs> <laughs> but lawyer definitely wasn't in the cards. And so um, I, I was at an ISSA meeting. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, currently I'm very fortunate and honored to be president of the Raleigh chapter of the Information Systems Security Association. Um, and at this time, maybe a little over four years ago, actually right at four years ago, maybe five, four or five years ago, uh, they had a gentleman by the name of Charles Smith. I'll never forget him. Um, great, great man. He came uh, to one of our meetings to talk about the need for attorneys with technical backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And then he uh, went on to speak about, you know, specifically, you know, for African Americans, um, for patent attorneys, which is requires a technical background, you have to have an engineering or a STEM degree in undergrad mm -hmm. in order to even qualify to become a patent attorney. Most people don't realize that there's an there's a different bar that you take in addition to the regular bar to become mm -hmm. a patent attorney. And so um, he uh, just talked about that and it just really, really intrigued me. Well, um, my friend and a uh, former interviewee of yours, Robert Martin, um, he pushed me, nudged me. He's like, look, hey, go talk to him. Go get some more information, go talk to him. And so I, I did. And he convinced me to apply to law school, to North Carolina Central uh, School of Law. and. For some reason, they accepted me. <laughs> so, um, so I wasn't I wasn't necessarily looking to get into law at that time. Um, but it was funny how those things that I kept speaking as a child, you know, I kind of spoke them into existence back then. They came to fruition. Mm -hmm. it didn't necessarily happen in the, you know, the timing that you would expect, but yeah. it happened, and it was really really cool. And um, Law school um, was by far the hardest thing I've ever done in life to date. Um, you know, we talked about the multitasking thing. Yeah. So um, while I was in law school, I worked a full time job. I was on the board of directors for the ISSA. I had a consulting business. I um, work on the tech team at my church. Uh, I have a wife and two kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm doing all of this at the same time, wow. mentoring people as well. I had a few people I was still continuing to mentor. And so um, it was tough. It was very, very hard. I don't recommend anybody do it like that, <laughs> but it worked for me. My first semester, I did awful. Oh, my gosh. I think I got like a 2.1 GPA, and they kick you out with a 2.0. Mm -hmm. So I was really borderline. Yeah. But um, I figured out how to study. I figured out how they do things. And, you know, the next semester, you know, my grade, my GPA increased and it just kept increasing each semester after that um, to the point I actually graduated with honors. Wow. And That's so, awesome. um, yeah. And, you know, it, it was just, I mean, my senior year, my senior year, they don't really have junior senior years, but my fourth year in law school because it was an evening program. Law school is normally three years, but in the evening program is four. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually did an internship with IBM. Also, while I was working a job in law school, <laughs> I guess it's a <laughs> consulting business. Um, wow. Yeah, so as you can imagine, I have an amazing wife. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it just worked out. Patents um, were something that I've pursued. I've written a couple of patents mm -hmm. um, under my professor's um, ID. Um, I'm, I was, uh, I don't know what the term is, a certified patent attorney, USPTO student or something like that. Yeah. So I could actually have a number to process patents and things. So I did that. Um, I had a couple of office actions I responded to that were actually allowed based off of my arguments. Uh, which means some people got patents because of what I wrote. So that was really cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Um, so it was, it was, it was really, really hard.
I met some amazing, amazing people who, I mean, we're texting probably on a daily basis now, still to this day. And uh, it's just been awesome. Yeah. yeah so. And what happened this week? Oh, yeah. So um, I took the bar in uh, <laughs> the end of July, and I just found out this week that I passed the bar on my first try. So, uh, yes, I am very excited because I never want to see that exam again. <laughs> it was awful. It's an awful experience. I don't recommend it at all. <laughs> so, you know, I people told me when I was thinking about going to law school and I was going through the process, Devon, don't do it. It is hard. It yeah. is hard. And remember what I said about when you challenged me, it just was like, okay, that made me want to do it more. Yeah. You said it was so hard. And so when I got in there, I realized, man, this is really burning me. I should have listened. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, it was hard. Yeah. You know, but it was, it just let me know that, you know, what's possible if you push yourself. Mm. You know? Yeah. This is what they would call a stretch goal. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the importance of uh, a patent? What does it do? Oh, so patents are extraordinarily important. Um, they protect your intellectual property, right? Um, so, you know, historically, historically, it has always been my understanding or my feeling that, you know, a lot of things that African-Americans and minorities African Americans in particular have created over the years were stolen, mm -hmm. um, you know, manipulated and, and so on and so forth. Had they had patents, they would have had some level of protection of their interests mm -hmm. to secure not only their future, but potentially generations based on what the invention was. Yeah. And so um, I look at patents as, you know, it could be a tool used for, for economic um, freedom. It could be a tool used to, you know, just just do tremendous things in the community. And so that's that was honestly what drove that's what drove my interest to patents. When I talked to Mr. Smith, those were the things that he talked to me about. And I was like, wow, I never thought of that. That sounds cool. I would like to try to do that. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so patents are very important. I really I mean, I really. I've tried, I tried to write a patent on my own long before law school. I just went to, I went to Google, went to Google patents. I found some patents and said, like, okay, I'm going to try to duplicate this with an invention I have. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> it did not work out. Yeah. It was a terrible experience because the language of mm -hmm. patents is so technical. It's so specific. It has to be written in a, a very exact way in order yes. for the patent office to accept it and it's just it's tough yes so learning how to do that i think is very important for me yeah and i think just like english mm -hmm. and cybersecurity, it is its own language mm -hmm. law is its own language and so you combine the two into its own yeah. language too yeah. so it's like a merged yeah. thing uh, absolutely. And, and the other thing, obviously, I, I work in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity law is really yeah. big right now. Or mm -hmm. I shouldn't say really big, but it's becoming big. It's a absolutely. And so cybersecurity and privacy law, you know, mm -hmm. patents and things like that, um, those are really, really good areas um, in the, in, to get into if, in law if that's of interest to you. Absolutely, because laws are being written right now. Regulations are going to grow. So absolutely. Law, law is a good place to, to invest in if, if that's if that's your thing absolutely absolutely um and it's it's funny how life just works in mysterious ways right how you always had that image of yourself yeah. and here you are passing the bar yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm now an attorney yeah um, hopefully that's my license will come in the next few weeks but you know, I've passed, and and so I'm mean, I'm just really really excited about what the future holds. Yes, congratulations! It's just so fantastic. The world has so many opportunities, and and I think it just doubled for you, right? So you can <laughs> you can make choices now that 
that benefit you or your family or really speak to your purpose, your why, because you kind of touched upon that a little bit, why you ended up pursuing it. Mm -hmm. it, it spoke to you and your values. Mm -hmm. um, what, what other motivators do you have? What, what is your purpose? Um, wow, that is a really hard question. Um, I'll be 40 in December, right? And so one of the things that I know is I don't actually think I've actually hit my purpose yet. Mm -hmm. I'm still searching for it a little bit. And, but as I get older, I kind of see God kind of orchestrating my steps in a, in a certain direction. And so the picture is, a, is clearer than it was five years ago but it's still a picture that's kind of being, being painted. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And so, Absolutely. Um, my, my main goal, to be honest with you, is just do things that help people. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I feel like even in the role that I'm in now, um, as a manager at, a at my company, you know, I told my team the first day is like, my, my job is not to, just give you tasks. My job is to help you figure out what you do best and put you in a position to be successful. Yeah. My job is to serve you and to help you. So help me <laughs> help you. Yeah. <laughs> to quote, quote a famous movie. So <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So um yeah, that's I mean, just just helping people. If you if you focus on helping people, helping people other than yourself. You'll 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 end up working your way into the right spot at some point. And mm -hmm. So it's kind of um, how it. absolutely love that. Um, a common trait of the the people who I've spoken with on this podcast is that they enjoy teaching. Oh, yeah. So, what does teaching mean to you? It is truly a passion. Um, honestly, it is the. It is the side reason why I got my JD. I, I, I've taught at ICT Tech and you know various other technical schools around the area. I love teaching. It is a passion, and that might be based on the fact that my mother actually she was in early childhood development um, when she was in college, and so um, she uh, just teaching is. I don't. I don't know what it is when I do it. I not no matter no matter how tired I am when I walk into the class. As soon as I stand up to start talking, my energy levels just shoot through the roof. Yeah. So I know eventually part of my purpose. So I take back my previous thing. Part of my purpose is to teach. Yeah. Um, how and to what degree, it still remains to be seen. But one day I would like to be a law school professor. Um, I will, we'll see how that goes. Um, but. I think everybody needs to have a little bit of teacher in them, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, if you have a family, if you have people you're around, you want to leave them with something that will help them develop and grow, right? You don't, you don't want to be someone who's always taking, taking and taking from people and yeah. not giving anything back. And I think teaching for me is part of that giving back. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a, I had a student literally yesterday, he hit me up out of the blue. I, now, mind you, I don't think I've taught him in at least seven years. He hit me out, out of the blue and he said, hey, Mr. Carter, hey, I got this friend that needs this, 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 and this for a business opportunity. Um, you think you could help him? And I was like, absolutely, I could help him. You know what I mean? My students, you know, hey, Mr. Carter, I'm just checking in. I remember you taught me this and I'm using this now. I get these types of messages, you know, fairly regularly. And so... I'm just like, wow, I, I did something right. I helped somebody. Cool. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I love teaching. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell. Um, and I know I interviewed Nia Lucky uh, on, yeah. on a previous podcast, and I believe you taught her too. Yeah, she was one of my students at uh, uh, one of the local technical schools. Um, she, she was a great student. I mean, she, she did the work. She, I liked, um, we call her, I like Lucky because she was willing to put in the work 
Mm-hmm. Right. And she seemed to really have a passion for it. Right. Like she wanted to excel. She wanted to succeed at what she was doing. So she would push herself. Yeah. So I even see that now. And I mean, she's, she, I mean, her career's taken off. She's doing great. She's, mm-hmm. she's speaking in different places and she's, she's doing all kinds of wonderful things. She's, I think she's managing a security team or something like that at this point. I mean, she's just taken off and I didn't expect anything different from her. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing and and being the witness of that as you, as the teacher contributing a little bit to her growth, um, so. and then seeing her paying it forward. So it's yeah. it's this ripple effect um, in the best possible way. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So what do you wish for? for your children and the future generations? Oh, that is a great question. You know, for my children, um, I wish for them success with struggle. And I know that sounds weird. Um, I think success without struggle is fleeting. It's hard Mm -hmm. to hold on to. Yeah. Uh, But I think when you go through some struggle to reach success, um, you fight a little harder to keep it. You learn lessons necessary to keep it. And so um, I wish for them success with some struggle. I don't want anything to break them. But I think, you know, everybody needs to go through something to achieve a goal. They need to see that they can persevere. Mm -hmm. Because when you never face challenges and you have success, when something, when an obstacle comes, you can't stand to it because you haven't exercised those muscles. Right. Right. And so um, even now, my daughter, she's in ballet. Um, she's doing a great job and she's trying to get her point shoes. So she's taking extra ballet classes to get ready for that. It's struggle. It's teaching mm-hmm. her she's got to do something extra to reach her goal. My oh, son, yeah. is, he's playing piano and he's working on <laughs> my six year old son is playing John Legend's All of Me, right, on piano. Wow. And so, you know, he his goal is to play guitar, but I told him the price of admission to play guitar is to learn piano. So he's struggling going through piano. And he's actually kind of gifted. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, it's it's really really um, that that's something I want to instill in my kids. Yeah. Um, as far as the future generations, um. I see a lot. I see a lot of them pushing forward and trying to overcome obstacles now. Like if you look around, you know, you see all the different protests and people opinions and things like that. Um, I would say that they they understand how to fight and how to push. Um, so I don't. I, I honestly I don't know. I'm I'm very curious to see what the future generations are going to do. What's mm-hmm. going to be the fight that they pick up, the mantle they pick up as far as um, pushing this country forward? Yeah. So I don't know if I have anything like I, I don't have anything prophetic to say what I see them going towards. But I will say I do see the fight in them. I see the struggle in them. And that's mm-hmm. interesting in itself. Yeah. So. I like that. I really, really like that. Looking back, what advice would you give yourself? Is there anything you would do differently? You know, I don't, I can't think of anything I would do differently. You know, um, I, I, I was very, I'm, I've been very, very blessed, very, very fortunate. You know, I did, I did well at most of the things that I've attempted to do. Um, I mean, the, the, the best advice is continue, just continue to listen, just like my mother mm-hmm. told me. That's the best advice. Listen to people and mm-hmm. and exercise discernment, right? Because you don't want to listen to everybody. Right? Um, I had a, 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 a old pastor of mine used to say, chew the fish and spit out the bones. <laughs> I know that sounds really old and country, but, <laughs> but, but it was a great saying because he's saying, look, Take what you take what is for you from whatever is being said and the rest mm-hmm. of it let it go. Everything yeah. does not apply to you. And so um 
that's I would say, yeah, continue to listen. That is really good advice. What's your definition of success? Uh, man, you're asking hard questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, I can say success for me is being able to enjoy my family, right? Being able to be with them, have fun with them, and hang out with them. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's success for me. I I am notoriously terrible at rewarding myself, right? I don't because I don't, I just don't require a lot. If you give me a couch and a TV, I'm good for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I, I know that kind of sounds lazy, but you know, as I said, I do so much all the time. Mm -hmm. Like being able to just sit and relax and just. You know, play basketball with my son. That's that's his new thing he wants to do all the time. Or give my daughter tips on um, ballet because um, I kind of forgot I actually um, had to take some dance when I was younger. <laughs> and so uh, that is really cool. Yeah. So uh, just stuff like that. Um, that's success to me. Um, yeah. Success is no. Here's success. Here's success. Success is knowing that I've made a difference in somebody's life mm -hmm. who is not directly connected to me, right? Because, you know, your family and stuff, you're always intuitively, if you're, you know, you're a good person, you're going to want to help yeah. your family. But helping somebody to succeed when there's nothing in it for you, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's success to me. That means you're, you're doing the right things. Yeah. So that means you have an impact. And that's that's all I want to do. I just want to make sure that this short life that we get on this planet, that I've made a positive impact on people. So that's yes. success for me. And I know for a fact that you are making a positive impact on a whole lot of people. I got to witness you working on InfoSecon, the, <laughs> the annual conference that the ISSA rally chapter puts puts together. It's it's massive. Under yeah. your watch, it grew phenomenally. So I know for a fact that community is, is blossoming thanks to your hard work and dedication. Um, let's talk about InfoSecon just for a second because okay. hopefully we'll publish this before the yeah. actual event so we can kind of build some momentum let's let oh, yeah. how about you give a little shout out to I, to I will do my shameless plug sure. yeah <laughs> so um so for everybody that's watching uh triangle info secon is our annual uh flagship event for the raleigh chapter of the issa uh in person traditionally we've had like over 1500 people in person that's security professionals that's students that's executives you name the level, they've come to our event because there's value there. Um, that event acts as our sole fundraiser for the year, which keeps our lights on for the ISSA. So uh, we ask that you please support us, come out. Uh, we have great sessions. We have great keynotes. Um, our, uh, two of our keynotes this year, uh, Dr. Diane Janicek, Esquire. Yeah, she's a doctor and a lawyer. <laughs> She uh, is the head of the cryptological school for the NSA. Yeah. Um, Mr. Armando C. Uh, Armando is a tremendously, tremendously brilliant person. He um, runs the Maryland Innovation Security Institute, MISI, up in uh, Columbia, Maryland, or thereabouts. Um, they are doing some really cool things. They have mock-ups of cities, utilities, and people can do penetration testing against that to see what we need to do to protect our utilities against hackers. Yeah. Like they are doing all this type of testing and cool things and make recommendations to the government. Um, the, these are our two keynotes. We have sessions on zero trust. We have sessions on the biggest hacks of the years, like the Casilla hack, the colonial post line, uh, colonial, uh, Pipeline. Well, pipeline. I'm sorry, <laughs> Colonial Pipeline, uh, the Casilla hack, uh, solo wings, obviously. I mean, yeah. you name it, we're going to be talking about it at this event. It's on October 28th and 29th. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, the evening of the 28th and all day the 29th is an opportunity for 13 CPE credits. Uh, don't forget the capture the flag event. Yeah, um, that's those, huge. Yes, that's our basically our hacker war games. So uh, Alex and the Storm CTF uh, team, they put together, they developed their own capture the flag uh, games allow people of all levels to participate for a chance to win some very, very, very great prizes. So please purchase tickets early and often <laughs> and uh, look forward to seeing you. And it's virtual, right? Yes, this is our second year being virtual. Um, it is uh, going to be used on a new platform called Hopping, um, which actually uses the same backend as the system we're using for this interview. And so um, we're really, really excited about it. Our sponsors absolutely love it. And we have some great sponsors. Um, it's just going to be a, a wonderful event, even though it's virtual and we would love to be in person. Yeah. We just couldn't get the clearance to do it with everything going on. And so virtual is what we have. Virtual is what we're going to give you. And it is still going to be a phenomenal event. So please come support us. Absolutely. And now anybody in the world can attend, really. Absolutely. So. I think it's fantastic that it is virtual. So to kind of wrap things up, mm -hmm. Devon, what are you grateful for? I, I mentioned this earlier. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for my family. Like they are. I, so <laughs> I met my wife in the eighth grade and we've, started dating in 11th grade and we've been together ever since she is the coolest lady ever and i mean anybody who will put up with me for this long is there are <laughs> in my life. so <laughs> and so um and honestly to her credit you know she's been you know managing the kids and things like that while i'm so involved in all these other things oh you know, and by the time and, and by the way on her spare time she got her phd so uh yeah, so <laughs> she's just a phenomenal, phenomenally talented woman. And so I'm very happy to have her. My kids, um, my daughter, she is just, she has such a sweet spirit. I mean, she's so smart. Um, I love the way she asks questions. Mm -hmm. I remember when she was getting ready for, you know, uh, middle school, because she's in the sixth grade. She just started middle school. And she would come and ask me, Dad, what was middle school like when you were my age? I'm like, dude, what kid asks a question like that? <laughs> yes. So, so uh, she's really, really cool. And then my son, he's just fearless. Oh, my God. If if he sees it, he wants to do it. I mean, I've seen this kid run into brick walls and shake it off, not a tear. I'm like, dude, why did you do that? I don't know. And then he'll go and do something else. Like, he's just fearless. And so um, no, I, I, I'm really thankful for my family. So. Wow. Well, it's it sounds like you have a powerhouse there at the Carters. Oh, man, they're, they're, they, they do a really, really great, great job with uh, keeping me straight. <laughs> they keep me in check. So. I, I am sure they are lucky to have you, too. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I want to thank you for joining me on this podcast, our 10th episode, the last one for the season of journey into cybersecurity and what a journey did you have and what a beautiful story i got chills this whole time <laughs> i said wow a whole lot of times um you are an amazing role model to so many people and i i bet the future cyber hero squad is watching you right now and hearing your stories and taking notes and and getting things into action thanks to this conversation and all the other things that you're doing. So thank you for showing us that anything is possible with the right mindset, with the right motivators and with the right people around you and, and just applying what you learn every day, just plugging away and sooner or later you become a lawyer and yeah. you become a teacher and a professor and you're making an impact on this world. So Absolutely. thank you. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I was extraordinarily surprised and flattered that you guys even wanted to talk to me. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, if I could leave anything like a kind of a lasting word with 
the next generation is patience is key. Don't, you know, getting things really, really quickly is not going to be, it's not the best thing in the world. Patience. It's going to come. Just keep working. It's going to come. I am an example of that. I never thought I would be an attorney. I never thought I would be at the point I am in my career at this age. And so just keep plugging away and exercise patience and you'll be fine. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. to get some on the real we appear to get gone victory is ours bring the chip home galactic and i'm looking to get more raise it up seen what you don't know running like the blood pumping from the pressure of a dream in the rush we crush whatever we touch where you been y'all everyone know you know what i'm saying huh. and if you still don't get it let it chill for a minute time is money and trust me man i'm all business and if you want something done do your shit to get it finished wake up victory's mine on top still on the grind gotta go get it right now holla at me if you with me it's time We gon' make it, show the world that I shine in our greatness Keep it real, never gon' fake this Till we make it, till we make it Taking off, flying high like a spaceship Take control, take a shot, what you waiting for? Keep it real, never gon' fake this Till we make it, till we make it Second verse, I'm telling you I'm ready to go Letting you know, cause I'm never alone The ones that I roll with are incredibly known For getting down to the nitty gritty If you really with me, let's go Moves made, dues paid Most talk, but don't do a thing We certified, observe as I Come through and give a true display We champions, understand me Standing under a victory canopy Canopy, the enemy was here The keys ready to drive at top speed Let's get it out Wake up, victory's mine On top, still on the grind Gotta go get it right now Holla at me if you with me It's time Gonna make it, show the world that I shine in our greatness. Keep it real, never gonna fake this. So we make it, so we make it. Taking off, flying high like a spaceship. Take control, take a shot, what you waiting for? Keep it real, never gonna fake this. So we make it, so we make it. I thank the stars above. I know that.